Yeah, that's right. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. We're glad to see you all here this morning. Come on in, take a seat. We're excited to worship together this morning and learn together. Um, it's a beautiful day. I don't know about you all, but I love the cooler weather. It's sweater weather, which is my favorite. I love being able to wear a sweater and dress warmer and stay warm. And we have heaters that work in our building. Praise the Lord for that. And because this place gets cold in the evenings. So we're glad that it, the heaters work well. Um, let's pray as we get started. God, thank you for this day. We thank you for your many good blessings in our lives, the way you take care of us, provide for us. And God, we are just grateful. And we ask today that our thankfulness comes out in our praise and worship of you. And Lord, we pray that you're honored and we give you this service today. In Jesus' name, amen. morning church it's good to see everyone here this morning a little chilly but we're all together and that's what's important let's please standing as we sing praise the name of Jesus <coughs>
Testing, one, two, three. One time when I was a pastor of a small church and we had an associate pastor and our offices were side by side. And we're used to hearing all the hustle and bustle of everybody out in the foyer. And one Sunday morning we were in our offices doing last minute prep and suddenly it got silent. We poked our heads out and looked in the hallway and didn't see anybody. We looked at each other and said, do you think it was a rapture? <laughs> everybody but staff, you know, that could happen. Um, no, I just ran to get him some water, but my timing was not great, but I didn't want him to keep coughing. Um, I've been reading a book as of late uh, for a class and, uh, on Jesus and the New Testament and the Gospels, and it's a fascinating book called Strange Religion by Ninja Gupta. And he looks at first century Roman culture, and he's trying to give you a sense at the beginning of the book of the culture into which Christianity arrived or was born or suddenly was on the scene, so to speak. And it's fascinating some of the things he shares about Roman religious culture. There were more gods in Rome than there were citizens. So that sounds ridiculous, but when they've done excavation, they've discovered more little statues, everybody uh, in Rome probably had 15 or 20 little statues, little icons of the various gods that they would worship and pay homage to. So it was a loaded field of all these different gods. There were gods of war and gods of having a fever and wanting that fever to go away. And there were gods you prayed to for financial blessing and so forth and so forth. It was just uh, an amazing uh, culture that was very, very religious and enamored with gods. And the, 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 the staple of religion, uh, to use his language, is uh, blood and smoke. Because the practice of religion in Rome was all about making sacrifices. And these sacrifices were slaughtered and there was blood and they were burnt and there was smoke. And so uh, he says in one chapter, what does the church smell like? And today we might say, well, coffee, that's the smell of a church. Uh, but in that culture, they would have immediately said that religion, temples, church, so to speak, smells of blood and smells of burnt flesh. Now, we understand uh, Judaism in the Old Testament practice sacrifices. We understand that concept of making amends, making a sacrifice in order to make things right. Uh, but it was in high, high gear in Rome, and it also had a very different spirit to it. Um, Romans or Greeks or others through history would accuse the Jews of being godless, and Christianity was equally accused of being godless. And the reason they were accused of being godless is because those leaders would walk into a Jewish temple or a Jewish synagogue and they would see no God because their religion was so thick with statues and icons and replicas of their God. And Judaism had no image of God. You were not to make an image of God. The only image of God was human created in his image. And so you weren't to make these false idols. One true God was different, above, beyond, invisible. Uh, but the culture would say, boy, these Christians are godless because they had no icon. The, the staples for, for Roman religion were temples and sacrifices and priests. And Christianity had moved away from all of that because of the full revelation of God through Jesus Christ and the continued rejection of statues or idols and the departure when Jesus dies on the cross, we're told that the curtain in the temple rips completely in half. The end of the sacrificial system because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice once and for all. A completely pure sacrifice and a resurrected living sacrifice so that he's the once and for all sacrifice. There's no longer any uh, sacrifices, no smoke and blood in Christianity, and of course, like Judaism, no icons, and no priest in Christianity, because Christ is the ultimate priest. Hebrews tells us not only is he the priest, but he's also the sacrifice itself at the same time. 
And so Christianity stood out as very odd in this Roman culture because there was this constant sense of sacrificing. And it was all in this spirit. Excuse me. I've got some allergy issues. I'm not sick, but I do have some allergy issues. It was all in this spirit of making sure you appease the gods. There was great fear in Rome. Uh, it was all about reciprocity, making sure you were good with the gods. If your child had a fever, run and get that statue. Had we accidentally let it tip over? Put it upright. Show it some respect. We don't want our child to have this. And so there was this constant anxiety. Priests weren't known for their virtue. What they were valued for in Roman culture was their skill set. He uses the illustration like someone who uh, defuses a bomb. Somebody on the bomb squad comes to your house. There's a bomb discovered in your house. Uh, you're stuck on the couch because if you get up, the bomb goes off. That bomb diffuser comes in and starts working on it. You could care less at that moment what sports team he likes, right? You don't care about his politics. You don't care about anything. Are you good at your job? Are you good at diffusing this bomb that I'm setting on? And it was that sort of spirit with the priest. As a matter of fact, they could get in trouble with the law if they didn't perform a ceremony correctly. That child's fever is not gone. You do not perform that ceremony correctly. Therefore, you're not going to keep that fever on that child. So it was all about getting things right because the God might be unhappy with you. Have you ever had that sort of, we'd like to think that's back in the ancient days and nobody thinks that way anymore. Do we ever fall victim to that? Do we ever fall victim to thinking, I got to think, get things just right or God won't be happy with me? Uh, I got to go to church. I missed church two Sundays in a row. There's no good excuse. Uh, I'm getting ready to get brushed off the playing board of the religious figures and characters that are going to make it to heaven. You know, God's going to say, I'm done with you. Like, you ever have that anxiety? Do you ever think I got to get it just right or God's not going to be happy with me? I think sometimes we do. I think sometimes, and, and even outside the church, maybe more so there's this sense, or maybe with some people less so. They don't care at all. Um, but there's this sense sometimes that God is kind of tapping his foot uh, and saying, how many times have I told you? I, I told you over and over, and you're not getting it right, and I'm really disappointed. And uh, things really, it's not just things aren't going to go your way. Uh, you know, you might have a fender bender that cleans out your savings account. So, and that's karma, right? We think that way. We don't like using that word, but sometimes we think that way goes around comes around uh, that person was a jerk to me and then they got fired well serve them right uh, that's the way it works like there's so many subtle ways we live like the romans in so many subtle ways i think we try to make sure we believe in that uh, undefined concept of karma and when you keep reading in this book and you say well man how did christianity turn the world upside down in 300 years how did it change everything one little comment early on in the book that, that got me thinking is the one thing that was fundamentally different with Christianity. I mean, all, so many things were fundamentally different, but one thing that might have caused the Romans to start thinking differently was this insistence that God loves us. That would have been so bizarre. Romans would have been like, no, the gods don't love us. We're like pets to them. And if we do well, we get an extra little piece of beef at dinner that night instead of just the dry dog food that we normally get. Uh, they play with us. If they're not happy with us, they're very comfortable giving us a backhand uh, or jerking that leash a little bit. But if we do really, really well, then they're like, well, you get a little piece of steak tonight because you've been good all day long. They, but, but they don't love us the way they love their children. If they make a choice, we're dead. They don't love us the way they love their spouse. There's not this intricate love. That's not the way it works. Gods don't love human beings. That would have been such a bizarre statement for Christianity to say that God doesn't just love us, but that God himself is love. Because in Rome, gods were power and they were all about being on top of the throne and having beings to serve them. So I think we don't really hear with the fresh ears the way we should the radical nature of God's love and how radical.
radical it is that that's the essence of who he is. I think sometimes we we just need to be reminded of that because uh, if we if we don't think of it fully the way we should, if we don't really realize how God is love and loves us, then we will slip into thinking uh, in terms of pride. Let me just warn you guys, I'm throwing off now. There's no clock up there today. So you guys are all in trouble. I have no sense uh, of where I'm at um, in terms of staying on target. But if we don't fully believe that, we can slip into functioning out of pride. And so underneath pride is this uh, assumption that uh, God really doesn't accept me the way I am. Uh, he really doesn't love me the way I am. Because the way I am is very human and not very divine. Uh, I'm very much one of these human beings on earth and not divine. I'm very much able to have a temper and be angry and, and resentful and unforgiving and and if God really knew what happens in my heart and the things I'm capable of, then he would really want nothing to do with me. So I, I will profess this pretense of morality. And that pretense of morality, that pride of presenting myself to God as, you know, I'm pretty okay. I mean, I'm not like my brother-in-law. I mean, have you, have you seen my brother-in-law? Like if we can compare ourselves, at least I'm not like this person or I'm not like that person on the roof. Like our culture loves showing us the crazy elements of our culture. And part of that is this love, self-satisfied uh, viewership that says, yeah, did you watch that reality TV show? Man, I am so glad that's not my family. Did you see the Thanksgiving episode? And, and we can have this pride that becomes this pretense of morality that causes us to never really present our true selves to God end up presenting this sort of I'm pretty okay and we might even start to mistakenly believe our own threat or if we don't go that direction we go in the direction of self-hatred and so we just have that mantra that says I'm no good, I'm no good, I'm no good, I'm no good God couldn't accept me, I'm no good, I'm no good I'm no good, uh, he might love other people I know other people that seem to be good people I'm not one of them, he might love the world in some general generic sense but not me, but not me both of those become avenues that we take that I think cause our relationship with God to be full of dishonesty. Satan gets a great victory. He loves using either of those extremes for me not to really be honest before God with my frailty, with my brokenness, with my not measuring up. And instead, I, like I said, I go in the direction of pride or I go in the direction of self-hatred and I have this kind of absence from God. My real self never encounters the true God. And, and we think that way because even if we say, yeah, yeah, God loves me, we still think of God's love like human love. And we think of him withholding it when we're not good. And maybe giving it when we're good. But scripture teaches that God is love. It's not something he has in a bucket. He's only got so much of it. And he dishes it out to the best ones among us rest fall short. It's his very nature. The best love we've ever experienced in this lifetime on earth from a spouse or a child or a grandparent or a parent uh, is just a glimpse, just a pale comparison uh, to the depths of God himself who is love. A.W. Tozer, and I've shared it before, says what comes into our mind when we think about God is the most important thing about us. So getting it right, let's listen to scripture. 1 John 4, 18 from the New Living Translation. Love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment. And this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Can you imagine that? That fear is not supposed to be part of the currency of our relationship with God. He first loved us, 1 John 4, 10. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. It's this existential, never-ending, ever-occurring love. I think we falsely sometimes think, yeah, yeah, I know, Jesus loved me and he saved me. 
And I remember that. It happened 30 years ago. And it was wonderful. But since that time, I have failed. I have been petty and jealous and bitter. Uh, I've been on the wrong side of conflicts, all of that kind of stuff. And so I've either emptied that bucket of his love or I've worn out that clean slate that he gave me with my own sins and failures. You see how we falsely think of his love as something that happened at one point in time? He loved me, he saved me, and now it's up to me to kind of clean up my act and be a good Christian instead of realizing his love is new every moment. His mercies are new every morning. It's this constant existential, the same level of love that he loved me when I was a lost pagan and heard the good news and converted is still the same level of love that he loves me with right now. He loves us first. He loves us continually. He proves his love for us. Romans 5, 8. Again, I think uh, like the Romans, as in the citizens, we need to hear these words the way they would have heard them with this fresh, radical nature. But God shows and clearly proves, Romans 5, 8, God shows and clearly proves his own love for us by the fact that while we were still sinners, Christ, the Messiah, the anointed one, died for us. We tend to focus on our decision for God. How am I doing? Did I convert? Did I make a decision? Am I strong? Am I staying committed? And we tend to put all the weight of our Christianity and our salvation on our decision for God instead of seeing his decision for us. Right? For God so loved the world that he decided, right? He decided and gave his only son. We know from broader scripture that this was a, a decision, an agreement, a plan that the father and the son both knew, understood, and planned together. So there's both of them in this, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And Jesus says, I don't. No one takes my life. I lay it down voluntarily. Jesus was volunteering his life. That any who would believe this crazy idea that God loves us, anybody who would believe the gospel, this crazy idea that God isn't up in heaven going, well, we'll see. But instead, he loves us more than we even love our children. And that's hard, like, right? Hard for us to imagine. We love our children so much. And it's just a drop in the bucket in comparison to God's great love for us. And he gave his only son, his only son. <coughs> Whosoever would believe would not perish, right? Would not perish, would not go to hell, would not pay the consequences of our sins and our failure, but would instead have life and go to heaven. Because this has always been God's plan in history. It's the cross is a display of what he's doing. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. Do you understand that? Because this is God's doing. It is not humanity's doing. We have not built a bridge to heaven. We have not built a tower like the Tower of Babel. We're, look, Lord, we're halfway decent human beings, and we've got a halfway decent religion going, and we've constructed this bridge, and we've made our way to you, and we're better than some of those other people. I mean, some of the other nations even that aren't as civilized as us. Look at the technology we've got. Look at how humane we are. We've got hospitals and welfare and decent human beings. Like the, 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 the ridiculousness of the fact that we think we are responsible for our salvation, that somehow, we can look at other people and say we're better than them. We can look at other people and say we've earned our way. This, this crazy idea uh, is a terrible idea because then it's based on us. And when we fail, it fails. It is the work of God through Christ on the cross that stands permanently in history. And his disposition toward you and I, a display of his love. And because of that, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Because the love of God has been extended to us through his doing. It's as dependable as him. So that Paul writes these words in Romans 8. And I'm convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above. 
or on the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all of creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. It's just so radical. I just I want us to appreciate the radical nature of the gospel. The, the jaw-dropping nature of the announcement that God showed up in the flesh. And he wasn't an icon or a statue that demanded flowers be laid at his feet. That he's a human being. He came in the flesh so that he could experience temptation uh, and suffering and pain just like you and I. So that he could know what it was like. And he could offer himself instead of us offering sacrifices. He could offer himself as the sacrifice so that we could be fully redeemed. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Paul declares in Romans 8, 1. Just the beauty and the radicalness of the gospel. One author says, we may have more failures than achievements. We may, have, we may not be wealthy or powerful. We no, may not even be happy. But we are nonetheless accepted by God, held in his hand. Such is the promise to us in Jesus Christ, a promise we can trust. And so the challenge for us is to bring our true self before God, not our cleaned up, you know, best version of ourselves before God. I want to make sure it's pretty consistent. I read my Bible, it's pretty consistent. I only hate that one person that hurt me years ago a little bit now when it used to be a lot, you know, whatever it is in our life. The challenge is for us to bring our true self, our complete self, our self that sometimes has some amazing good in them, and our self that sometimes has some amazing pettiness in them, sin in them, to bring our true selves before the true God, the God of Scripture, not the God that says, well, we'll see, uh, or the God that says, you're pretty good compared to your brother-in-law, so don't sweat it, but the one true God who both accepts us completely and paid the price itself to redeem us out of sin. To bring ourselves before our true self, before the true God. I was hesitant to use this analogy, and I mean it in a good way, so if anybody's bothered by this analogy, I'm not trying to bother you, but I, I thought about God as, as our therapist. Like, when, when we can bring our true self before God, before the true God, then we can share and say anything. You see the point of my analogy. We can come to God and say, the truth is, sometimes I really resent this person. And I still have that in my heart. And I know I'm supposed to be better after all these years. But the truth is, I really don't like it when I see them do well. And I really wish that somebody would find out what a deep faith, deep, you know, whatever it is. To God, our full self, our true self, to the one true God. And when that happens, we can go forward in becoming more of who he designed us to be. Because we let go of this pride where I have this free sense of morality, and we let go of the self-hatred, which is not God's reflection on us. And instead, we bring our full selves, our true selves to God, fully accepted, fully loved, and we also, too, with tears in our eyes before Christ that was paid for that too, reality. And we bring ourselves to God trusting him. Trusting him. So that we can say anything. We can share anything. And he can work in our hearts. He can work in our minds in the way we need to. Jesus says in Matthew 6, and we'll finish on these words, and when you come before God, this is from the message translation of Matthew 6, and when you come before God, don't turn that into a theatrical production either. All these people making a regular show out of their prayers, hoping for stardom. Do you think that God sits in a box seat? Here's what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so that you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God, and you will begin to sense his grace. Let's pray. Lord, we don't simply want to know you accurately. We want to live 
by that accurate knowledge of who you are. We want to live trusting you. We want to live not enamored with fears and anxieties, not believing if it's going to be, then it's up to me, not living in silos and isolation, protecting ourselves or pushing up our own sleeves or secretly believing it's our hard work that got us where we were and the shame others don't see the same. Lord, the truth is we are all dependent upon you. We are all sinners in need of your grace. Give us the wisdom to trust you and to see the gospel. But not simply to use our freedom, as Paul writes in Galatians, as an excuse to serve ourselves, but to use our freedom to trust you, to lean upon you, to walk in deeper and new ways with you, to become people who think about others before ourselves, to become like you. Give us the privilege of living gladly and full of joy because of the realization of your love. In your name we pray. Amen. Go ahead, Rob. We won't have to get it all right before we can come before the throne of grace and ask for forgiveness. Because he's always there willing to forgive us. No matter what condition or what state we're in at the time. Amen? Let us be standing and sing this song. Just as I am. Thank you 
so much for sending Jesus for us to be that sacrifice for us so that we don't need to worry about if we're living good enough, if we're better than the other person, that we can just relax and enjoy your love and the joy that Jesus brings. So I pray that we remember the, the sacrifice that was made for us. Think of Jesus often and, and strive to be like Jesus. And I pray that you put it in our hearts that we don't punish ourselves when we fall short. That we just keep looking to you and keep wanting to be your children with good love. Thank you again, Father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. separate and set apart from communion was the offering. Did any of you remember that? It was a 
phrase that turned into like one word in my mind as a kid. It's like separate, separate, what? what? Um, so we, we take the offering now. It's not technically part of the communion, but it's still between you and God. And uh, what your heart tells you, go with that. I thank you for your giving here. Um, don't feel pressure when the plates go by. You're not being judged. And also, I mean, here you can give online. There's a box in the back. You can put money in. Whatever, whatever touches your heart. It's between you and God. Rejoice in that. Father in heaven, thank you so much for loving us. I pray that uh, you use our lives in ways that bring others to you, that we love more, that we shine your light, and do our gifts, our, our actions. We just point the way to you, Father. Thank you so much for what you've given us. In Jesus' name I pray. church next door has uh, asked us to help out uh, on a project coming up this coming Wednesday. Uh, that's the uh, 20th at 7 o'clock. Now this is at their facility next door. Uh, I made the mistake of looking at the flyer that's up dead on the patio and, and the, the ladies, uh, this is for the ladies by the way, uh, the ladies got an email that was more clear than uh, the poster. The very bottom it says the address of the church next door which is 2255 and our address is very similar to that just with one district being different so um, it, um, it is at the sunny it is at the LDS church next door and what they're going to be doing they're going to be um, filling backpacks and um, other items with hygiene and care items and it's going to be at seven o'clock on Wednesday the 20th and uh, it'll be uh, a time for you to uh, help out with them. Uh, they've invited us to help them, so it's a good cause for the ladies of the congregation here to join the ladies there next door. The fall worship night is coming up this coming uh, Saturday, the 23rd, from 5.30 until 7, out here on the patio. We've had several of these in the past, and they're very, very uh, uplifting. Uh, they have music, and they have uh, communion there, and we'll have uh, uh, a time of worship and communion. Uh, any questions about that, you can see Isabella Alcarez on that. The Ladies' Christmas Party is coming up very, very soon. Uh, it'll be on, um, let's see, Monday, December 9th at 9 o'clock. And, of course, we'll have a special guest there that night. Um, hopefully Santa will be there. Um, the donations this year will be going to the Susan G. Coleman Cancer uh, Research Fund. Uh, that'll help support the uh, work that... Uh, Terry and Steve Payton are doing to keep Terry healthy and to get her back to normal and back to good health. So donations will be made to the Coleman facility um, for that uh, fundraiser. Uh, you can see Sharon Larson, Uraine Cook, or Kathy or Jessica McBride uh, for the ladies' Christmas party on December 9th. Our prayer night will be coming up this coming Wednesday, being the third Wednesday of the month at 6 o'clock. Um, communion prep is needed for December, and you actually uh, get a bonus because there'll be three combined services in the month of December. You'll see those there on the 1st, 22nd, and the 29th. 
which leaves the 8th and the 15th for the, uh, the communion prep requirements for the month of December. So you only, have to get, you only get the opportunity, I should say, to do it twice for the month of December. Um, if you want to help out with communion, let me know. For the month of December, I will write you down for that. Thank you for those who have done it so far this year. Um, something that is not uh, on a slide, uh, we'll, we will be partnering, and you might have uh, a memory of this from last year, um, with the Hart Family Homes uh, that will be coming up for this Christmas, where we'll be purchasing gifts for the foster kids, and Sarah will have more details coming up about this project uh, very, very soon, so stay, stay tuned for that. Thanks, have a great week. Pray for those among us who have sick or loved ones or close to them, Father. Please go with them. Find ways to heal them for the sick. We thank you, as always, for those here that wait with us. We ask our prayer. Thank you all for being here. You are dismissed.